Craig and welcome to A Voice of One Crying Out. Today we're going to continue talking about how do we bring revival. In my previous video I had shared what the Lord gave me for how to bring revival. For those that don't know, that would be considered prophecy. Prophecy without interpretation or understanding works as a vision or dream. It has a direction and a larger picture and sometimes steps. If you have understanding, it is a clear path. But most of us have muddy paths. We have a little idea, the concepts make sense, but the how-to in following those words is often not fully understood. So these next videos are going to be the breakdowns of each section of that prophecy so that it's not without a clear path. This video then is about seek, ask, knock. Be persistent and pray according to my will. Pray the things of my kingdom, my justice and my righteousness into the earth. Pray for the fear of the Lord that it would be in you and also in our nation. So in Matthew 7, starting in verse 7 and verse 8. It says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. The Lord gave me a different order. He said, Seek first. I believe this is because often we're asking. But if we don't seek out understanding of His will, understanding of what his desires are. We will not be able to ask appropriately. Like it says in James 4.3, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Let's look at this honestly. Our society, our culture, no matter where you are, in church, in synagogue, in it doesn't matter is selfish. Even when we do things for others, it often has a give-to-get mentality behind it. When we go to work, we're not looking to produce the most value. We're looking for our paycheck. So we're, we're giving something to get something. We are even taught this in church with giving. Sow your seed so God can bless you. It is good to sow your seed. But the requirements of the law were fulfilled in Christ, not in your doing. Does God withhold his blessing from those who do not work and do not do good in the earth? Of course. But he will still take care of those people's needs. That means your needs will be met whether you give to God or not, whether you uh, sow or not. He loves us enough not to spoil us, though. He doesn't want us thinking that we can be worthless servants who do nothing and get whatever we want because we gave money in an offering. There are principles in Scripture that still apply to us. He says he will bless the work of your hands. If you don't have work from your hands, there's nothing to bless. All that to say, we want things the easy way. But we will have to seek the Lord for his wisdom and understanding. Then ask according to what understanding he shows and gives us. And then we must knock until the doors are open. So there's an action involved. So we seek for his will. Then we ask for his will to be done. He desires to redeem. He desires to bring life to the dead, to heal the sick, to bring reconciliation between himself and mankind, to reconcile fathers to their children, children to their fathers, husbands to their wives, wives to their husbands. He desires to prosper mankind, even you. I'll put the scriptures in, in the description below so... I'm not saying scripture after scripture after scripture. So you can go and look up 
the scriptures yourself and, and see what it is that God is saying. Read the context. Get, get an understanding. This is part of seeking his will. So we have to get outside of asking selfish prayers. But we ask for God to do these things in the earth for our neighbors and communities and to prepare us and partner with us, us to partner with him to bring these things about. The, the things that I mentioned earlier, the healing, the sick, raising the dead, bringing freedom to the oppressed, cancellation of debt to those who are enslaved to it. That, that's what the year of Jubilee is. It's a cancellation of all debts. And when Yeshua proclaimed that he was sent for this purpose, and, and he said, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, or the year of Jubilee, that was him saying, all of your debts, all of your oppression, all of the slave stuff that you got yourself into is being reversed. All right, so next we have, knock, knock. God, open up the doors to San Diego. Nothing happens. Knock, knock. God, open up the doors to San Diego. Nothing happens. And then you hear the Lord say, which doors? And you're like, oh, which doors? Knock, knock. Open up the doors to the community of Hillcrest so that your glory may enter in, that those there would have the veil pulled back, and that their ears would be open to hear your words, your truth, and do great miracles among them, that they would have an experience of the Father to help draw them in and send forth your workers into this area. Include me, I will go for you, but open the doors as we go forth and knock that your kingdom would be revealed in this area. This is an example. It's a genuine prayer, but it's an example. We must be more specific. And, and you can add more things in there. Like, uh, you know, you can pray for bondages to be broken off. And, and the spirit of oppression, the spirit of homosexuality, the, the things that are binding them up and keeping them uh, from the Lord. You can go after those things. Will it be gone? No. The reason I say no is because this is the part that we usually miss. We ask God to do all these things. We, we command, we declare, we decree, and then we don't do anything in response to that. See, when you go, you will run across people, and you'll Tell them about the good news. The kingdom of God has come. You're knocking on the door to their heart, saying, let, let me in. Let Yeshua in to your life. And you will see great and mighty things. Just, just a little opening. But see, the veil will be lifted when you go. It's not going to be lifted right away when you pray. Because God doesn't want the veil open to whatever comes. He wants the veil open to his messengers. So the veil is going to, to stay like that until the word of God becomes available to that person. Then it will lift so that you can speak the words of truth and life and they will hear and understand, perceive, and you'll see miracles take place as you pray, as you command blessing upon their life, you will see these things come. All right, so we're praying according to God's will and his kingdom. So justice and righteousness are part of this. So let's go over some things about his kingdom and his will. His kingdom is here. We aren't praying for it to be suddenly upon us. The Pharisees asked Jesus when this would happen. And he basically called them foolish for thinking it was a suddenly. But that it starts small and grows. And he's basically referencing Daniel chapter 2, verse 34 and 35 here. But, but he says to them, the kingdom is within you. Saying, you have the responsibility of manifesting or bringing the kingdom about. That that's true of all of us that are in the kingdom of God. We have the responsibility to bring the kingdom, the justice of God, his righteousness into the earth. So in Daniel 2, it starts as a rock, 
that then grows into a mountain that fills the whole earth. So our prayer is that we see the kingdom come through us in a way that expands into the earthly realm wherever we are and that it overthrows all things of any other kingdom. That, that when we go out, the authority that he gave us and the power that he gave us would be exemplified in the earth and the powers of darkness would be pushed back and destroyed as we come against them. Because we're coming in the name of our God. We're not coming in our own name. We're coming in the name of Jesus. We're coming in, in the name of Adonai, our God. And because of that, his power will show up. His goodness will show up. The things that are of the kingdom, we will see coming through our lives. So Psalm 103 tells us to forget not all his benefits. This is part of his kingdom. The benefits are kingdom benefits. It says, he forgives all our sins. He heals all our diseases. He redeems the oppressed. He crowns you with love and compassion. Also known as giving you an identity, right? If you get a crown from the king, he's giving you the identity of royalty. He satisfies the desires of your heart with good things. He gives you strength and he meets the needs of the oppressed. This is his justice and righteousness. He defends, rescues, protects the poor, the outcast, and the helpless, and requires we do these types of things for him, with him, alongside of him. Now, when he says he crowns with love and compassion, he forgives all sins, he heals all diseases, we are his ambassadors, his emissaries, his representatives, the ones who go on his behalf to display who he is. So if you're judging people, if you're um, looking at them with disdain or uh, you don't want to touch them or you don't want to be around them, Jesus touched lepers. Leprosy in that day was incurable, and if you got leprosy, you were outcast from everyone, and Jesus still touched them. Why? Because of compassion. God shows compassion, and we, if we're his children, must have the same characteristics as him. You must get over the selfish attitudes of, well, how will this affect me? What, what's this going to cost me? Because God knew that it would cost his son's life, and he sent him anyway. And it could have cost him everything if Jesus failed and was tempted and sinned, right? We, we wouldn't have had a perfect sacrifice then. If we didn't have a perfect sacrifice, all hope would have been lost. So God put everything on the line. Yes, he sees beyond what we see, and he can see the end from the beginning. So he had a foreknowledge, if you will, that things were going to go right. But that doesn't, that doesn't get rid of the possibility that corruptness could have entered in. If he just gave in to the wrong thing once. All right, so let's, let's move on because, you know, that's, that's a deep topic, subject, and can be very controversial if you think there's no way Jesus could have sinned. Well, if there was no way Jesus could have sinned, he couldn't have been our representative. He couldn't have been tempted. And he couldn't have said, not my will, but your will be done. Because he had a will. He didn't want to die. <laughs> right? That's the point of that verse. He's saying, I don't want to go through this, but so that my father will be glorified and so that this will be accomplished I will do it anyway and that must be the same attitude that we have no matter what the cost even if it's going to cost our lives we must lay it down and do what God has required go to the lost people go to the people that that hate Christians the witches the the people that have been taught that that we're evil we're opposed to them. We hate them. And show them love and compassion anyway. If they spit on your face, love them 
anyway. If they beat you, love them anyway. Because that's what Jesus did for you. So here's another picture of what this is to look like. And Jesus said this of himself, but take this on as part of your calling because the Spirit of the Lord is given for this purpose. So when you're baptized in the Spirit, this is what it's for. It's to come upon you. So Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Lord, the Sovereign Lord, is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, this next part Jesus left out, and the day of vengeance of our God. There's, there's another vor- verse in Isaiah that says, do not hope or do not look forward to the day of the Lord, because it is a terrible day. It is full of destruction of the wicked. And though we don't want wickedness, we don't want people to have to die and be crushed and smashed and removed. We would rather see them turn to God and wickedness be abolished from their life, not wickedness abolished with them. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. These will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. See, where to display his splendor. That's, that's what this is about. You get anointed and baptized with the Spirit of the Lord so that you can go and display his splendor. It's not yours. He shares it with you, but it's it's his. You're to steward it as you're to steward all things of, that God gives us. So they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated that will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Our job is to go restore the earth, not seek its destruction, seek wickedness to be destroyed, but to seek God's redemption in the earth and to rebuild and restore. So strangers will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and your vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. See, all all the wealth of the nations will come into the kingdom of God. And, you know, this this servitude thing, don't look at it like people are slaving. This is this is a desire to be in the house of God in such a way that they are willing to work for somebody to be in it. So instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in the land, and everlasting joy will be yours. He goes on to say, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. And that's what Jesus, Jesus came to do. Establish an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are the people of the Lord. That they are the people the Lord has blessed, or a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. This is, this is a beautiful thing. If, if you recognize this, this is part of the identity that he gives us. He clothes you with garments of salvation. So when you go out, People see and experience salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. See, you're not righteous because of yourself. You're righteous because of what he has done. 
And he puts this righteousness upon you so that sin becomes further and further from you. That, that you are able to live righteous. You are able to live no longer as a sinner, but as a righteous person because he has transformed you. He has given up himself and made you like him. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprouts come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. You see, God is not about destroying everything. He is about bringing righteousness and justice in all nations through us, His people. That's how it works. The Jews and the Gentiles serving our God, bringing justice into the earth. We need to have this in us so we can pray according to what God would have us praying for. As for the fear of the Lord, that's the next part of the prophecy, that is like honor and respect, not terror. There's some level of not wanting to do something that the Lord doesn't like for fear of consequences but the reality is if we are acting out of being afraid we have not understood or experienced his love for perfect love dispels all fear when you respect someone you don't do things that they don't like and you do do things that they do like you honor them with your actions your speech and do not do things that would poorly reflect on them or harm them in any way. At least not intentionally. This is what we desire people to come into. This type of fear. So they respect and honor and revere the Lord our God. That they would know the Lord and begin to live in a way that is pleasing to Him and honoring of Him. See, God has compassion on those who fear Him. We are praying for hope, God's way to be restored and brought into the earth, that his compassion would meet people and bring the redemption needed in the earth, and that multitudes would surrender to him and come under his love, authority, and kingdom, and that it would be seen through us, his people, and those who come in, who also become his people. We want to see the same thing birthed in them, See, in, in the kingdom of God, there isn't a competition of who's the best or who's the greatest. If you want to compete for that, you're going to have to serve a lot more people. And that means humility, humbling yourself, going where the people are the most destitute and getting in the trenches with them to help them get out. So where to be the hands and feet of God meeting the needs. So when we pray for these things, pray with that end in mind that you are part of the solution to your prayers and that as you pray, you're building up, let's say, a bank account that you can withdraw from when you go out to minister and you can see the glory of God revealed before your very eyes as you say, be healed rise up and walk and see the glory of God. God is so good. And he, he's revealing these things and sharing these things. And, and I'm sharing these things on, on account of him to bring him honor and glory because I fear the Lord. I want to do what he desires for me to do because it is a blessing. It's a blessing for me to do, but it's a blessing for you. I want you know, I, I see people healed and delivered from demons, and, and I have visions. And when I hear about other people doing these things, I don't get jealous of them. I pray that God give them more opportunity, that they be greater at doing these things than me, so that more and more people can experience the kingdom of God and the life-giving power of His Son. We want the world to know salvation. 
I want you to know salvation in such a way, to be so intimate with it, that it is your garment, that his righteousness would be your your clothing, so that you're going forth, bringing salvation and righteousness with you everywhere you go. People are changed and transformed through your life. Father, help this to sink into us, to, to really put this on our hearts and our minds, that it would be the meditation of our hearts, that, that we would desire to glorify you, and that as we pray, we would bring about a change in the heavenlies and in the earth so that your kingdom may come, your will done, and that the fear of the Lord would begin to spread in the earth. God bless you and watch over you and keep you. May his countenance come upon you and be filled anew with the Holy Spirit. Father, send your Holy Spirit fresh upon the lives of those listening. Increase their boldness. Increase their compassion, their love for others, and their desire to see your kingdom coming in the earth. In the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen.